Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Planting for Pollinators. And if you haven't already, go ahead and type your name and city into the chat box. We've got a lot of folks coming in from a lot of different places, and we're happy to see all of you here. And I am going to introduce our speaker here in just a moment. Are we on the next slide, Ellen? Is that, do you have, is that the right one? Yes, I think so. Let's see here. Great. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about Ellen. Ellen is a professional horticulturalist who specializes in beautiful heat tolerant reduced irrigation plantings. And uh, I have known her for, um, I think, gosh, since 2013. And uh, we used to go out and catch bees and butterflies together for our collection. So Ellen is a lot of fun. She has a real passion for pollinator gardening. She recently retired from the UC Davis Arboretum and Public Garden, and she loves sharing her knowledge. And so um, we're really excited to have you here, Ellen. So um, if I didn't mention this already before, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A and we will get to that. Um, every time Ellen does a poll, which is gonna be a lot of fun, we're gonna um, get some feedback from you. Uh, you can weigh in and then she will answer some questions. So take it away, Ellen. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, as, as uh, Ann mentioned, I'm retired from UC Davis Arboretum and Public Garden. And there I had a lot of experience um, doing everything in horticulture from propagating to building the database of plant names to uh, designing landscapes, picking, selecting uh, plants for plantings. I'm fooling around my light here, it looks kind of weird. But um, I, uh, when I, I put consulting horticulturists there because that just means that if you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. It's not like I'm going to charge you money or anything like that. Um, and I also volunteer for the California Native Plant Society, uh, and I'm on the board of the Pacific Horticulture Society, and I'm an active master gardener in Yolo County with a group that we started there, uh, Gardening for Pollinators. And it's a team of six people, and then we uh, organize tr trainings of, like train the trainer, for master gardeners who want to learn more about pollinator gardening. And then we take you out, we look at the plants and do all that stuff too. Um, I'm not going to cover the basic things in this talk because there was already a Zoom with Chris Howington of the NRCS. And this is just the link to that that you can get. Um, you could, cop I mean, you can't really copy it, you could jot it down. But you'll, you have a copy of this printed, I believe, that um, Anne's sending out. So you'll be able to get it off of that. But it's really, if you just type in Master Gardener Stanislaus, it actually takes you uh, to where you can see all the YouTube videos. So I'd like to just know a little bit about what your class goals are. How would you describe your knowledge level? Just like I know zip, or I, oh, I feel like I'm really experienced. Um, and then also some, uh, what, what would you like to get out of it? I know some people just want to do the right thing. Other people are really into California native plants. Um, some people are me, they're greedy, they want more flowers. Um, and, um, or you really want to try ecologically to buff up your, your garden. Looks like we're seeing some voting happening here, Ellen. So you might not be able to see the poll, Ellen. Can you I see can, it? it popped up. Yeah, oh, good. Okay, so you can yeah. see how people are voting. Looks like we're pretty good here, Ellen. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So it looks like... Um, oh, good or average. That's really good. Yeah. And people are really hoping to take away some California native plants to use okay. and plants that benefit, benefit pollinators and then a combination of plants that extend bloom and easy low water plants for bees. So that's great. 
Okay, good. So when planting, the, it's, it's always a push-pull of decisions, you know, to do just whatever you feel like versus trying to do what might be the best thing. And um, so I love this cartoon. If I was on an island, I saw a boat, I'd be all excited. If I was in the boat and I saw land, I'd be all excited. But really, you know, they just have two completely different perspectives. And for the, the pollinators, and I'm going to primarily talk about uh, insects as pollinators, the whole broad uh, thing, creatures that might be pollinators was covered in the previous talk. Um, and they just want a lot of food. They're going to the flowers for the nectar and the pollen. So they want a plant that has many, many flowers over it, masses of flowers, because that's easier. They can get to them really easily and, and save energy. You want to try to find as many plants as you can that bloom for a really long time. And that's a really tricky thing because some things are not long bloomers. Um, and then also there's a niche at either end, like early winter, uh, January, even into December when the earliest bees are coming out, that there's only certain plants are going to be blooming then and then certain ones that are going to be blooming very late. And so we're going to talk, mention, and I'll show you pictures of some of those. And then of course, the more diversity you have, the greater diversity of bees you're going to have. So, okay, the bees are like, where's the flowers? And you're, well, but I want it to look beautiful. Um, I don't want to do any work. I know I never want to do any work anymore because I'm retired. And it kind of hurts your body when you get older. Um, and we should all be thinking about things that are going to grow well in our local hot summer conditions. And then, of course, maybe in the front of, in the back of our mind is adapting to these hotter summers and and longer heat waves and trying to find the toughest things that we can, but ones that need only medium low, um, medium or two medium low, there's a typo right there, sorry. And then trying to find sturdy plants is harder than you would think. It, it just seems like the nursery industry is always bringing us new plants and, and we get all excited about them and we plant them. And some of them I have found they just aren't very sturdy. And that's something you learn uh, with experience over many, many trial and errors and a lot of a lot of errors. So from the pollinator perspective, if you want to plant to encourage pollinators, it's all about the flowers. Not all flowers are created equal. Some don't have any pollen and nectar like this double rose. I don't know, uh, Anne, if you can see my pointer. Um, yes, we can see it. Okay, good. And then uh, some may have only pollen. They may have not have nectar glands at all. Others may provide both pollen and nectar, things like that picture of the sunflower. Um, but you really want to avoid um, the double petal petaled flowers because those are the ones where the um, floral parts that contain the food, the pollen, have been replaced by petals in, by the breeders. So from the gardener's perspective, it's all about, you look good, you feel good. And I heard somebody use that quote in another talk and I'm like, what's that from? So I, like anything, you go online and Google and you Google that and you get this whole slew of, of online media attention. It's a football player, Deion Sanders. And he was actually talking about his success. If he, if he looks good, he feels better. If he feels better, he plays football better. He gets paid better and it goes on and on. And then you have a good life. So if you, so that's what we want. I mean, for me, I want it to look pretty out there. I want my neighbors to come by and say, oh, I, oh, your yard looks so good. I don't want them to say, you know, geez, it's a mess. And then I have to go, oh, but it's because I'm doing it for the bees. It, because I tell them that and they're like, why would you want to do that? But so, so it's, it's partly about public perception and getting other people to do the right thing, as well as us trying to learn to do the right thing. It's very complicated to combine plants with overlapping bloom times, which is something that all of the, the books uh, and the references, you know, uh, the California Bees in Blooms, everybody says, do that. Well, well, thanks, because guess what? Some things bloom in response to short day, some things bloom in response to cold temperature ahead of time, some things bloom when it gets warmer, so, you know, it's, it, it takes, again, it takes practice. So don't despair um, and try to find those long bloomers if you can. Sorry, my mouse is going crazy. 
There is a dizzying amount of information out there. I recommend you start with UC and Xerxes with the Xerxes Society sheets. There's so much online. You could spend the rest of your life learning about pollinators from Xerxes. They have all the information on the lifestyles of the insects, but what they have are plant lists that are not based on horticultural practice. They're more uh, wildflower lists. And it focuses on native plant lists, and we'll look at why that is. Um, so I use these two books, these two books you see on the right. I, I keep them at my side all the time. There's an interesting resource I did with a friend of mine that's online on the Arboretum website uh, under sustainable gardening, uh, 10 bees and 10 plants. It's like a beginner handout that you can download when you're first getting started or that you could use you know, to, to show other people pictures of plants that you like and that you know you can grow and say, look, it's shown right here. Um, most of this talk is from two main sources. One is the online ANR um, publications that were done by the Urban Bee Garden, which was at University of California, Berkeley. And then also things that are in the book, California Bees and Blooms, which was written by Gordon Frankie, who, whose research site that garden in Berkeley was. I think it actually might be closed now. I think he's moved on to farm support for pollinators. Um, and then he wrote this book with Robin Thorpe, who's a professor, was, is, a, is now passed away, but was a professor here at Davis, who was super helpful to every person that wanted to know about these. And they did a lot of work together. And so there's a lot of wisdom uh, in this California Bees and Blooms book. Sorry, I keep going up to the right. So, okay, I'm gonna take the gardener point of view for a, little, for a minute. Now you, you need to think about how much natural look can you take? This picture of a, of a, a, a city garden in Davis, it's the West Davis Ponds. It's set up for flood control so that in the winter, the water comes in and it fills up. All the wildlife comes and shows up. You know, it's all got native plants in it and some weeds, but they just manage the weeds. They, um, the geese are there, there's foxes, you know, there's all kinds of birds. So that's what a truly, natural garden if you want to go all natives and let the cycles of being dormant and being green and things like that and learn to combine them you just have to know that you're going to have some brown in there and i'll and i'll show you there are like 50 names for brown and i'm not going to tell, discuss them but um you want to think about that because that comes into play and i'm going to talk about that more so how much time do you have are you retired do you have a bad back? Um, you know, are you still working full time and raising children? And if that's true, then you really need to plan for the maintenance that's going to be available. Um, you should start, especially with the plants and as well as the insects, with local California information sources. You know, I've tried to use information sources from back east, uh, from the Midwest. Um, a lot of good stuff from the universities there, <clears throat> but it doesn't really have anything to do with us because their insects are completely different. And then the cycles of bloom and, and dormancy are going to be completely different. So you can learn from those sites, but you, some of it may be theoretical rather than truly applicable or practical. The other critical thing is when you see a Latin name of a plant, and you don't know whether it's perennial or, perennial or annual, don't assume anything because on a lot of the Xerxes lists, they just mixed them all together, depending on how the lists are sorted. But they, they do have lists that have A's and P's that show you which ones. But then I always strip out the A's because I'm not so interested in those because I've already decided about those. I know I'm gonna tell you that. And then, uh, because of the amount of work they are. So you wanna try to learn your plants. You don't waste your time on things you can't get anywhere. If you see a plant, somebody says, this is the most fabulous plant ever. Um, and then you go online and you can't find it, it's not gonna be any help to you. So a lot of people are working this and working on making things more popular and more available. Um, so that, that just will take time. Also, I recommend that if you don't have an area yet that you start simple. And I'm gonna talk about starting simple and building from there. 
So everyone says, and I agree, uh, use as many California natives as you can. The, the reason for that is that the UC Berkeley, it was called the Urban Bee Garden, I believe. Um, they had a thousand kinds of plants. Out of the thousand, 950 of the plants were not California natives and only 50 were California natives. But of those 40 taxa of the, like that few bit, 80% of the native bees were attracted to those. Whereas only 8% of those other 950 plants actually attracted bees. So if you just want to plant and then hope for the best, you could do that, but there's like, you, you can influence it by your plant selection. Now, I believe in native grasses. I love grasses. Um, one thing we did at the Arboretum that we found out was the, the Art Shapiro, the butterfly expert, um, a member of the Academy of Sciences. Um, he said that after we started putting grasses that were native bunch grasses in our native plant collection, a butterfly that had gone extinct in the Arboretum that had completely disappeared reappeared. So it's my, if you plant it, they will come theory that now I apply to all kinds of stuff because I figure what the heck, we should try the historic species and just see what happens, see if we can get the diversity back up. So why don't this really don't support pollinators in that they don't pro provide food? And that's because they're wind pollinated, wind pollinated plants lack, the, the flowers lack petals. So that's the part of the flower that's attracting the bee, the color, and I'm sure smells and but the initial attractions a lot of them are by about um, color and UV light. But I think you should use some bunch grasses and I always have bunch grasses every in everything because they add habitat value and because of the way they're like on this bottom picture with these deer grass because of the way they form that little tuft and then spread out they provide habitat and nesting spots for ground nesting bees. And I always have a dream that I'll find a little bumblebee nest out there in mine. Some of them, as I mentioned, just from my little story, they will provide laurel with food for native butterflies. So this is an example of an all native, super easy, super low maintenance plant combination. Three plants, can't get much easier than that. Deer grass, which is the native um, bunch grass, Moonberg origins. It's always there. You only cut it down to rejuvenate it, make it green. Um, if you want to, if you don't think it's still too brown or gray for you. Um, the Maritime Ceanothus here in the middle, which I believe is Valley Violet, um, which blooms in March, uh, sometimes late February. Beautiful, solid, covered with flowers, purple. And then in front of it here, California fuchsias, which are blooming now. So what happens is this is a spring shot. So in the fall, the grasses are still there. This turns green, and then this is red. And so it goes from gold, blue, green to gold, green, red. Oops, don't hit that one, Ellen. This is too wordy, um, but again, a little bit back to maintenance. Shrubs are gonna be, I'm gonna start at the bottom. Shrubs are gonna be the, the lowest maintenance because they're pretty woody, they're permanent structure. They cover the ground, you know, uh, would you dip its weed, seed germination. They only need the minimal amount of cutting back uh, replacement unless there's some kind of problem. You just have to shape them um, and correct occasional things that go messed up. But in the shrub department, there are fewer shrubs that are long uh, bloomers. There still are some, but there's few. And, and then there's also some that are more, it's very, uh, I'll, I think I have a slide of the leucophyllum, the um, Cenizo or barometer bush, and, that, and later on, and I'll talk about it. The second least maintenance one that doesn't need as much work are these deciduous or evergreen perennials. And in the perennials, the evergreen perennials, which aren't true shrubs and could be killed to the ground in the coldest weather, and sometimes can be cut to, to the ground just for maintenance, and then they sprout from the roots, um, those function in, in your landscape as a shrub in that they're pretty big, they'll take up a lot of room, and in a 10 by 10, you can have three plants and you can fill the whole thing. And then you don't have very much, as much work and you still are gonna be providing for the bees. Perennials give you a huge range of sizes and types and colors. 
We're going to look at a lot of those. Some of them bloom early, some of them bloom late, bloom late so you can use that to overlap your bloom times. Um, and then the annuals have long blooming and a high rate of return because they're super attractive. But being annuals, they're usually replaced every year. Some of them will perennialize a little bit. I'll show you a couple. Um, but the problem is that with, with uh, annuals, there's only a few that bloom all summer, like sunflowers. Everybody should grow sunflowers. As long as you're irrigating anyway, like in a vegetable garden or something like that, you can go ahead and plant those. And, and over at the Arboretum, they put them out, wild ones, sunflowers, and they're still blooming now, and they still have bees on them. And even though now it's September, most of the bees are finishing their life cycles and going quiescent for the winter, they still have stuff on them. Um, many of the native annuals are really spring bloom only, and that's this picture on the bottom. The uh, lupin, there's poppies in there, clarkias, um, and then this picture here is a phacelia, tenacetifolia, which once it gets really hot <clears throat> without supplemental water, will go out of bloom. So then you just have that shorter season. And I'm just putting a little thing in here because I have little information on the late season annual bloomers right now, but I'm just starting to learn about that. And um, I'm gonna just show you a couple that we've been fiddling with trying to figure out if they're gonna be manageable in a um, low maintenance garden or if they're gonna just try to be weedy and spread all over the place. And uh, this one here, this is a vinegar weed, which actually about two weeks ago was just beautiful. Sort of looked like a small silvery shrub, had these silvery hairy leaves, small uh, purple flowers. And then it is a trichostema, if you know the woolly blue curls native. This is a native annual. Um, but it has this beautiful period very late in the season, and I think there's really po a possible place for that in, in gardens, even though it is an annual. Um, also, the tar weeds I've been seeing on more and more lists now. I haven't really started looking at them, but I know other people are using Madia elegans. When I went online to look at that one, it's just the you know, daisy one, similar to the ones in the picture down on the bottom. Um, oh, by the way, that bottom picture is a Master Gardener project of the Yolo County Master Gardeners that's in Winters. And it's in front of a bank when you go about the roundabout. So keep an eye on that for next spring. It's very beautiful. Um, Betty elegans is a very vari variable species with many subspecies. And so some of them are tall, some of them are short, some of them are medium. So I'm gonna buy seed this year and I'm gonna plant a bunch of them out and then see what I get. And then see if I get different seed sources, if I get different plants, because that'll be fun. So one thing that a lot of people don't realize is poppies, the native California poppy, um, usually has one bloom and then it's it if you let it go to seed. But what they found years ago at the Arboretum is if you, right after that very first bloom, which makes your eyes pop because of the color, while the soil still has moisture in it, you can run a mower over it with a high setting so you don't cut the, the base of the plant off and it'll come back and it'll bloom again and it'll bloom longer. And that's a technique that I use on some of the little ones that I poke into my garden and um, often they keep blooming, keep going. So if you want to do just a straight annual bed, because it's, it is like a different kind of gardening, uh, don't forget to do great bed preparation because seed germination is only marginally successful on really uh, compacted soil. Uh, it won't work with mulch, so it's got to be mulch free. You want to do some prior removal of existing weeds, especially my nemesis, which I think is the plural of nemesis. Uh, perennial weeds, bindweed, and Bermuda grass, which is just a total everyday battle. Um, if you plant your seedlings and you get all your seed to come up and, and you manage to keep the birds from eating it, um, you want to wait and not put the seed down until the rains are starting, hopefully. And that way they can germinate before the birds see them because if the birds get in there, they can eat a lot of them if you do it too soon. But you have to learn to identify the seedlings of your annuals because you're gonna to have to weed out the weeds or halfway into the spring, you're gonna have 30% weeds and, you know, which is maybe okay with you uh, and 70% um, desirables. And then the thing that I just 
we, we had the annuals for a while, the Arboretum, and it was just too much because we couldn't keep the volunteers working on it because they would get so frustrated with all the weeding. They would just do nothing but weeding. And they really wanted to do something certain bit more interesting. And so finally they stopped putting those annual plantings in. And this is, an, this is the picture of that annual planting that they used to do with the uh, golden lupin, which is a Davidson native wildflower. These would go dormant as soon as it got hot and turn make seeds, set their seeds. All the bees in there would be amazing, the bumblebees and other kinds of smaller bees. Um, and then it's just a big old fire hazard with this biomass. And so you, the grounds people would have to go in and mow it down. And then that takes it so it doesn't look messy anymore. Like your neighbors won't come by and go, your garden looks terrible. It'll be all mowed and clipped nicely. So you just have to remember, you just have to go back if you want these kind of displays. Also, because you can't, you don't use mulch for this technique. Um, every year the weeds get more, and so you you just have to keep on weeding, as the sign said. So I've started with getting, when I can, getting some seeds and either clearing a small spot and like weeding and turning up and amending a small spot to just tuck a few seeds in where there are open spaces or planting them on a six pack and then moving them. Um, and I just tuck them into the bigger perennials and shrubs in the early spring. And I have a thing for California poppies. Um, these are my two favorites. This is, oh, I forgot, Red Chief, I believe. And this is just a uh, alba form or creamy form that you can buy at your local nursery in the seed packet section um, that I just buy when I see it. So I always put those out too. And they always have different kinds of bees in them. I'll show you. I got a great picture of a spider hunting in that red one, just weeding. Okay, Anne, are you still awake? Yes, I'm here. We're just <laughs> launching our poll now. What are some of the advantages of perennials over annual plants in the garden? Ellen wants to quiz, quiz everybody. And uh, Ellen, we don't want to forget either that because there's a poll, it's time for you to also answer a few questions. Okay. So should I just look at the chat? Um, it's under the Q&A, and there was one under the chat, but early on, somebody asked how a pollinator garden differs from a butterfly garden. Well, butterflies are pollinators, so you will get both which is fun right now because I went outside to look at my asters just before this and I counted four different species of butterflies. I was like, yay, you know, whenever I, I'm like St. Francis, you know, I want the birds to land on my arms and be my <laughs> friends. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And so it, like I, I say jokingly, if you plant it, they will come. So, um, and somebody, I have, what butterfly was that? Yeah, I think and they I'm wanted thinking, to know which one Dr. Shapiro uh, hadn't seen around and then it came back. Do you oh, remember? I think it was a uh, uh, woodland skipper. Oh, okay. Or the one in the picture, there might have been a picture of a, um, okay, California buckeye butterfly. Yeah, I think he was uh, referring to the woodland skipper or yeah. whoever it was. Um, and then you have one other question. Will native annual plants reseed? Yes. But it depends on um, the vigor of that particular plant, how well adapted it is to your particular site. In, uh, in other words, biology being what it is, all the stuff you put in there is going to drop seed. But then there's some competition between the different types for the pollinating and for the soil, is which, who's best adapted. So what's going to happen is it's going to shift your combination of annuals. So you're going to have more weed, weeds, but also you're not, it's not going to look the same every year. What will happen is like right now, I just have a regular annual crop of nigella, which is not native, because that's the most successful competitor in my yard. And I let them come up and then I go through them where, they're not, where I don't want them. I just yank them out, throw them in the compost. And Ellen, it looks like uh, people did pretty well in your quiz. All right. It's just to give you guys a chance to not have me talk at you. 
All right. That was it for the questions so far, so. Okay. Um, picking the plants, you know, if you're like me, if you see a new plant, you want it, you know, so <laughs> you just have to save yourself some trouble, you know, if you can't help it, then that's okay. We consider that normal, but you want to try to create plants first that will help you make your garden look good by creating structure. And the way you make structure is you pick some tall stuff, can be shrubs, or it could be, like in this case, this is um, uh, Artemisia douglasii mugwort. And see how it's nice and tall here? And then this is actually that crazy annual uh, vinegar weed that looks like a shrub. And then these are dormant salvia spathaceas, which are perennial. And then there's a bunch of perennial grasses and a perennial, not a perennial red, but it's a tree, a small, a large shrub. And um, so that, I mean, I like that combination. I thought it was really pretty. It's got a lot of brown in it, but they don't use much water over there. They're only watering it enough to dust things off. You know, they're trying to establish a native meadow that is adaptable to our exact climate here in Davis. But, but don't stop thinking about the framework if you can, because that's what your neighbors are going to see. They're not going to see the other stuff unless you take the time to make them stop and look with you. People think that in the Central Valley native plants, you know, they used to come to the plant sales and they'd say, I bought a native and I planted it and, and it died. And I would always say, well, did you water it? And they go, no, it's a native. I don't need to water it. And I'm like, no. You do, not only to get it established, you have to water it to get it established, but you have to um, realize that in nature, some of these plants would be like in areas where there was flood over the winter, so there would be more, the soil would be more charged with water, or they might do better in wet years and totally die in dry years. So for if you're managing an ornamental garden, which I think I want, my pollinator garden to be an ornamentally attractive garden, they need some summer water. And I've been ex uh, practicing in my yard and I've got it on a sunny spot on every two weeks, but I just want to water it, I water it for long enough to really penetrate the soil. And we don't want to go into that because that's a whole long <laughs> lecture I'm sure you've had. Um, and then I don't water for two weeks and my neighbors come by and say, oh, your garden looks so pretty, you must water a lot. And I go, no, every two weeks. and they. They kind of can't believe it. So, you know, it, it can work if you pay attention. I always, we also have heavy clay soil, you know, I do, so it kind of helps if it dries out in between. Um, I worry about climate change and reduce water supplies and charging me more for water. And so it helps to just right now already buy into the low water um, and see how you can push your landscape to need less. People always want to know, can I mix natives and non-natives? And I say yes. Now, I am in the California Native Plant Society. I'm a big proponent of California Native plants. But I think to get people to accept the ecological value of some plants, if you start them out by retraining what they see as beauty, um, and this is a planting that was is at the, outside the Arboretum Teaching Nursery in Davis, and it's natives. It's a giant buckwheat in full bloom. It was glorious. It was covered with buzzing insects. These smaller areogonums, and you're going to learn areogonum is a great insect plant um, in this talk. You're, you're going to see them over and over. Solidago, which is an, also an excellent, and oh, there's a spelling error, Cascade Creek, um, long, late flowering. So it fills that late season niche. So even after that a giant area buckwheat was done and starting to color, turning to seed, these are these solidago here are still in bloom. In the same planting, farther down under the exact same conditions, Salvia lanceolata, which I believe is this gray mass here, has pale pink flowers, very subtle. Roses, can you believe Rosa grusenachin, which is a super tough uh, and only every two week fine with that kind of rose. Um, and then all of these salvia gibbonsis hybrids, and we're going to talk about those more too in a little bit. When I first started out that planting, I 
tried to create structure by using herbaceous perennials that were going to be evergreen, like these lavenders here. And then we've got a rose shrub that's going to create some structure and height. And then I just fell big time for this aster purple dome. And a lot of people don't like it. And I think it's because they're not patient. And what I love about it is right now it looks glorious. So there's not that much going on right now. A lot of asters come up, bloom, and then fall over because they're not compact. This one has butterflies on it out in my little butterfly area I was talking about. And what it does is it adds this perk of color late in the season and pollinating um, uh, nectar and pollen for the insects. You, a lot of lavenders are useful and a lot of asters are useful. Um, and sages are super useful. We'll talk more about that. The, the lavender does need maintenance. There is one, this Goodman Creek Gray, that we recommend that was an, selected as an all-star because that one you can prune any time of year, whereas these, this type, well, not this type, but the, the Munstead, what I call the uh, English lavenders, they need seasonal pruning and they need it right or only one time. But that's a little beyond the scope of this. Uh, salvia hotlips, I've been telling people, this is a plant that you just can't keep down. It blooms from the time it warms up in the spring and it's still blooming now. It gets big, surprisingly big, like three and a half feet tall, three and a half, four feet wide. And although it needs pruning in the spring to prune it back, to make it branch, to keep it dense, it has all kinds of bees on it. It has the large carpenter bee, which you see here, the xylocopa. Um, it has a little sweat bees on it, which I see sometimes with their heads sticking in here. I, I got a picture in my yard of a, um, one of the carter bees, you know, the one they use fur to make their nests or hairs from the plants, not fur, sorry, uh, from the nest and for their nests. Um, and then here on the right is this, this, this is the not very intensely impressive um, source of all that nectar but it's planted with other really showy things. This is a Roselia and, and grape myrtles. And this provides food for birds in terms of the seeds. And this is a great hummingbird plant. So you're adding to your garden diversity by mixing those kinds of things together. Um, I want to mention all those, what are called sub shrubs and the salvias or the sages, the RML sages rather than culinary, have two, two main parental uh, components. One is the microphylla um, salvia, which is an evergreen, and you can cut it to the ground to rejuvenate it, sprouts back from the roots kind of plant. And then the Greg eyes, or the Greg salvias, which are more upright, tend to get bare at the bottom, ha have to be more pruned, and if you cut them at the ground, they're dead. So they're, they won't come back. But now there's all these incredible hybrids and so this is an unexplored field of which ones of these will, are gonna make the best garden plants and the best pollinators. And, and I just, will, I, what I do is I go, this is a smaller carpenter bee. It's a, a different species of Silocopa than the big one. And uh, these are the males, they have the yellow. And uh, what the carpenter bees do, just a little bee talk here, is they use their mandibles to chew a hole in the base and they're what's called nectar robbers. So they stick their little proboscis, their tongues in there, and they drink the nectar without providing the pollination services. And that's why they're called nectar robbers. They're busy little dudes, I say. This is a newish thing for me, a discovery for me. I keep seeing typos in my slides. Um, this is salvia mystic spires. In the Berkeley urban gardens, they grew indigo spires. And then indigo spires, salvia, it used to bloom all the time. You plant it in the spring. As long as it gets some water, it just keeps blooming and blooming and blooming. And we put this one out, or the staff put this one out in the Arboretum, um, and it never stops blooming the whole summer. It started early. I kept waiting for it to go out. I kept taking more pictures, and I'd go back, and I'd see bees, and I'd see butterflies. And now I have photos of this plant with carpenter bees, bumblebees, honeybees, smaller kind of like wasp hunter things too, you know, I mean, and it, it's just a, a very generous, it must be a very generous nectar source uh, to attract all those different kinds of things. Plus it's color. 
you know, color in the hot weather. In terms of native salvias, um, they will attract both bees and butterflies. I've gotten both native bees, uh, different varieties of native bees on, on these, as well as this is our, which apparently ends as you guys don't have there, maybe because you don't have the riparian habitat. But this is the pipevine swallowtail, which we want to be part of our garden and, and all, and just be floating all around looking so tropical and fabulous. Um, of the, what are called Cleveland uh, sages, this on the left is Aromas, but very similar looking is Alan Chicory, uh, Winifred Gilman is a little darker and uh, smaller leaved, but they all are shrub-like in that in your planting, they're gonna behave as shrubs. You're gonna only cut them back once a year to shape them, make them, come, make them branch out, um, and then uh, they'll just do their thing for you. You just do annual uh, corrective pruning. Uh, Bees Bliss is down here. It's a ground cover. Um, and also Dara's Choice is more of a perennial ground cover. This Bees Bliss had all kinds of different things on it. And you can see, I don't know how many plants that is, but I think it's only like three. And it was a huge area it spread out to cover a really huge area. And I thought maybe it was a woman named Bee at first that it was named for. And then when I realized how many bees and insects it had on it, native bees, I, I realized why they called it Bees Bliss. Just another very drought tolerant, but also large uh, salvia is this Salvia brandigii on the right, one called Pacific Blue. The blue doesn't photograph very well. It's a little, little darker than that. Um, the regular species of brandigii or brandigii sage tend to be much paler and kind of washed out looking. This one's really got good color. Takes the heat, takes the blasting sun, at least for us. Okay, so I would like to say a perennial is a plant that if it lives, <laughs> if it lives, is gonna bloom again next year. And so this is where the, the really getting plants that are tough and adaptable, I always tell people, if I didn't kill it, you can't either, because I like to travel, you know, it, it, I'm not like, you know, I'm out there looking at the insects all the time, but I'm not like all being really careful about making sure water exactly right and things like that. True herbaceous perennials die at the ground in the winter. A totally great one is in bloom right now, the sedum, herbs, fruit, or, uh, um, oh, yeah, what's the yeah, autumn, autumn something, autumn joy. And, uh, but there's a lot of new varieties. There's some purpley foliage ones. So far, I haven't found one that doesn't flop, but it might be because I put it in too much shade. Um, they have a pretty long season of bloom. It's at the right season um, in my garden because my garden's kind of dry. They bloom a little bit later. You do want to cut them down in the spring. You should leave the stems to let the, lar the larvae of insects use the stems for nesting um, and hiding and and pu you know, let the pupil cases stay there. But in the spring, you should cut them and get them out of the way of the new growth. Um, there are many, 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 many herbaceous salvias, both native, as I showed you earlier, and non-native. Oh, there it is right there, Autumn Joy. Um, asters, that's actually not an aster, sorry. Asters for summer and fall bloom. This is an uh, uh, ornamental oregano, uh, hop leaves purple, south-facing sandy slope, low water just gorgeous in full bloom and lots of little bees are on that. And look at how popular that Achillea right there is. These are little sweat bees um, that you can tell by the way they carry the pollen on their leg there. And um, not all Achillea species are created equal. Some are more attractive to bees than others. So that's something I'm super interested in trying to learn about. If you use evergreen perennials, the advantage is they keep foliage on the ground over the winter so your plant doesn't completely disappear, which is always a problem for me with things like echinacea. Once they disappear, you know, if I haven't marked them, I forget where they are and I might walk on them and kill them. Um, this is a really great one. Tucrium is in the Lamiaceae family, the um, mint family. Mint family has a lot of, is, produces nectar, which is used by a lot of these bees, the smaller bees especially. So prostrate germander is this nice perennial. Uh, you just shave off if you don't, oops, I'm sorry. If you don't like the, the seed pods, some people don't like the way they look, you can just shave them off and then it'll re-sprout green and stay green till the next year. Again, I mentioned these microphyllotypes, which this one is um, 
not Sierra San Antonio, but festival. It's a San Carlos festival. And this is a plant I use in the hot sun where it's shady, shady, shady. And then all of a sudden in the afternoon, warm, you know, you have this hundred degrees and full sun. And, and this thing just goes ha 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 and then laughs and has more flowers. A particular favorite of mine also is the Erigerons and uh, there are definite cultivar differences there. Okay. You're on in. I'm gonna run over for sure to talk faster. All right. We are polling and asking the advantage of evergreen perennials over deciduous perennials. Ellen's getting, uh, asking some harder questions here. And uh, while, people, <laughs> while people are polling, um, we had a question, but it was not in the question box. It was in the chat. Where is it? Oh, um, when do you prune Winifred Gilman, the salvia that you, I guess it's the Cleveland Lady Eye that you mentioned? Yeah, some people like the seed pods and like to leave them. And that's always a good practice for any bird seed, eating birds that are around. Um, they might use it for food. Um, and they don't grow. Um, some of the natives push really hard as soon as it cools off and it gets wet. And then that is not one of them. It doesn't push that fast. So I would wait and leave the seed pods if they weren't, didn't fall, you know, look awful. But if they still looked, you know, part of the garden. And then I would do it just before they start to push when the days start to get longer uh, in February and March. So Alan, I guess your, your, your poll wasn't that hard. I don't know if anybody else is like me but I was writing down every single plant that's your favorite. <laughs> not like I couldn't watch this again, but uh, somebody sent me a little cartoon today that said, you know, the problem with gardeners is they want every plant, they want all the plants, they don't know where they're gonna put them all. And uh, I'm having the same issue where I'm gonna have to just choose some because some of these uh, plants you recommend do get pretty big and they need some space. Right. So you wanna look at size for sure. Yeah. All right. It looks like for uh, the poll, people did really well. Uh, All right. They got it right. Cool. And I don't think there were any questions just yet. So go ahead. Okay. Um, so the thing that I felt like a light bulb went on in my mind was when I realized that you know how plants have bloom seasons. Some bloom in the spring, some bloom in the summer, some bloom in the fall. Well, you know what? Bees have seasons. And this is something that, you know, when you first start, you're just, it's so complicated that it took me a while to be able to step back and, and begin to see it. Um, and so there are early spring and summer bloomers. I'm gonna show you a chart I made from a bunch of the data that I got out of the Frankie uh, Research Project reports. And um, early spring, you're going to get catmint. This right here has uh, scabiosa columbaria, pin, the pincushion flower in that purple in the back. This is that same garden that's behind Anne's head when she's talking, but, but it's taken from the perspective of that sign looking toward where you're sitting. Um, and so it's a really, a really attractive uh, combination of colors. And then there's summer. And that, that garden can look one set of colors in the spring and then start to turn all different colors. And so this is late season. You've got Russian sage sticking up here. You've got the summer asters are still in blooming. I think this is actually not a summer aster. It's a um, big Bob's blue or one of those. Um, and then the barometer bush, the surprisingly the barometer bushes all came into bloom super late this year. I think from that 100 degrees, and then we had a temperature drop, and that's why they call it barometer bush, because big changes in the uh, air pressure and in the temperature is what pushes it into bloom, apparently. Um, Vitex also and sages are also good for the summer, for summer bloom. And all the plants I'm telling you are the ones that are the top ones 
from a combination of looking at all these different resources. Um, so what are bee seasons? The bees have, depending on the genera or species, have different seasons when they emerge from their hibernation and they go have a flight, what's called a flight season, where these are native bees, mostly solitary bees, but not all, like bumblebees are communal. And then, um, like this first one right here, this habropoda. Well, I always wonder, why come I've never seen a habropoda? Heavens, they come out in February, March, and April. I'm like too busy, like enjoying myself, going to plant sales and looking at gardens <laughs> to stop and take pictures of the pollinators then. Um, and so that's, and then they, they leave in the end of May. So these are the ones that are gonna be the spring. And these Andrina are small and difficult to identify. Osmia are a lot easier to identify. And uh, so you, that's probably gonna be one of the ones you would learn first in the spring. But by July, if you're still gardening and outside and you're seeing bees, you're only gonna be seeing these. These, are, these have already gone and they're, they're over. They're back in hibernation. And they usually have laid their eggs, fed, made their nests, laid their eggs, provided the food, and then sealed it. And then in that time, the larvae are developing, but then they'll, they'll don't emerge till the following spring. So it's just different survival strategies to not be competing with one another. So these are the, sorry, these are the ones that I always see. Eek. Um, Pepinaps is super easy. Squash bee, if you have a squash plant, look in the flower first thing in the morning and you will have identified the squash bee. Mellis so sweeties, I'm gonna show you pictures of those. They got really long antennae, so they're super easy to pick out. There's a few other ones you could, that Sebastian and another one that um, you need to really look at super close up to tell apart. But these are like the ones you're most likely to see and that I have seen. I have my own little family of amphidiums out on my Duranta that I say hello to every morning. This is the Carter bees. They scrape the hairs off and make nests. The individual divisions between the eggs that are laid, um, they lay these walls and they're made out of the uh, hairs they take from the plants. And megachyle, which is the leaf cutters. And those are the ones that I'm gonna show you a picture later how to ID it. So what's the most common ones that people know and that learn first? Bumblebees, that's a no-brainer. And most people, all they care is they don't care what species. The carpenter bees, same things, they're all black. If you see a green sweat bee, you'll never forget because it's truly green. Um, and then these smaller sweat bees, which of which there are a variety that I have not learned by sight yet. I can tell with a really good close-up for some of them, but, but but not by just by eye. It's too um, they're too small. So what's the overlapping? So early, you want if you can and you have space, you want to have a manzanita, a red bud a ceanothus, and maybe an Oregon grape. And those are gonna take care of January, February, March, uh, into April. And these are seasons, you know, the researchers don't always agree with how they frame stuff. And these are seasons that were used by uh, Neil Williams and um, Kimora Ward, who now has, is, um, I think she's in Arizona, but uh, it was a personal communication that I asked him for information he sent me a chart of, of their research, right? ranking the blooms, uh, which were the most preferred out of the whole slurry of, of things they looked at. They ranked the ones that had the most bees and did, gave them one, twos, and threes. So these are super high uh, visitation by bees. April to June, toy on, coffee berry. This is when the gum plant, um, which is, has its pros and cons, that it starts, but it goes a long season. I'll tell you more about that. And then Facilia Californica, which I've seen and it's okay, but it's not super showy. So you might want to tuck those in somewhere. So now what you still see if you go out there is you'll see the gum plants. Helianthus uh, bolandri blooms really late. There's a lot of different helianthus to try, especially the native helianthus. Um, I haven't tried them all yet. I'm going to try work on that. Uh, Facilia californica, the California Facilia. This is an interesting one, the desert globe mallow. That's this picture here. I've had a hard time establishing that, I think, because the soil is pretty heavy. Um, but it's in the list and it's highly visited. So 
I think it's worth a try um, if you can. And this is just a little bee, a little another sweat bee. This is a male. Doesn't have the little furry legs to carry. So one thing that Gordon Frankie always says, I took a couple of set weekend seminars with him, and they kept saying, put on your bee eyes. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and what they mean is, if you want to see bees and you want to start really being able to look at them, <clears throat> you have to stand perfectly still and let your eyes relax. And then you'll see motion because some of these bees are really small. If you're moving, you won't see them. So you have to stop. And when you see motion, then you really focus in on that motion. You also don't want to move very fast. You want to inch up slowly. I've been told you should wear like khaki, brown and green, you know, colors because they won't startle them as much. Like you should never wear a white shirt like the one I have on apparently. Start with the big ones. Once you know the xylocopa and you learn a little bit about it, you're going to feel all knowledgeable and you'll be telling your friends how they're called um, rubber bees. Here's a really nice uh, green sweat bee. This is that uh, Agapostum texanum. Sorry. Um, these are longhorn bees they, that were on a flower in my front yard. And you can also identify them by where they carry pollen. And I don't have a good example. I'm sorry, these are males. Only the females collect pollen because they're laying eggs. So they're collecting, making it to put in the nest. Um, but this is a mega kyle that was on some bulbenia on my front driveway area. Um, and you can see that pollen is all stuck on the underside of the abdomen. So if you see it's got pollen on the abdomen instead of on the legs, boom, you're in a whole family, a completely different group. And so it can really help you learn um, as you progress. So Frankie et al, uh, and it's a long list of authors. Uh, there's a, a list of all the references at the very last slide that I, of all the things I'm showing you here. And they divided the results up by which plants attracted restricted groups. Like Achille millifolian only, only got this one, uh, I guess it's a family, maybe an order. No, it's a family. Uh, Thalictidae and, um, so these are good. They, they have a certain, like these, the xylocopa go to, the, the black carpenter bees. This is one, like I said, if you look inside your squash flowers and you have a habitat nearby, you'll see those. I always want the, the um, ones that attract bumblebees because I particularly fall into bumblebees. And then, um, the, then also they sorted them by their origins are they native or uh, non-native? So NN is non-native, California natives, California. And these have no prominent bee groups, meaning they attract all kinds of bees. So my interpretation of that, that if the more diverse bee tax that a plant gets, the more likely I'm gonna get some, some bees to support. And so these are the ones you should focus on. Now, part of the problem here is I can't keep Biden's alive. You know, uh, and then uh, some other things. I'm going to show you some more slides. Of these are annuals. Sorry. The, um, some of the black-eyed Susans are really they hate Davis water. You know, and they turn all black. So anyway, that that's why I went through and sort of picked out and in my mind <laughs> tossed some of these to the side. But they might work for you. You know, you might have something different. But these these are the ones that have a lot of weight in their research. So then in the middle are perennial and woody plants that are two or three B groups. And these are plants that are all thriving in Davis. Solidago, here with a nice furry pollen-legged, I assume, sweat bee. Although I didn't check, I should check. Um, the lavenders here, I have Spanish lavender, but I really think the longer blooming Munstead English lavenders and the hybrids might be better longer blooming sources. One that's in bloom very late and for a very long time is the Russian sage. Um, had all kinds of weird, crazy bugs on it. Um, and this is a chaste tree, a vitex. I, a lot of people haven't heard of it. It is a deciduous, small tree, small to medium tree, kind of a hybrid between a tree and a shrub, but it's deciduous. A lot of people don't like that trees lose their leaves um, in the winter because it leaves a big hole, so you have to consider that. And then this Gallardia, 
which are fabulous, all different kinds of them seem to have different kinds of, depending on the season I go out, they have different bees on them. Okay, number four. All right, we're ready to launch our next poll. So go ahead and uh, put in your guess. So Ellen, are there any trees that you would recommend that are evergreen that attract pollinators? I know you had mentioned Toyon to me, which is a little bit more shrubby, attracts a lot. Well, you know what um, Kilaha saponaria is, the soap bark tree? Uh, There's a tree called the soap bark tree that uh, years ago we were growing them because I heard they were, the flowers are so weird. I wish I could show you a picture. I have one. I just didn't, don't have it here. They have these big glands on them and that you can see the nectar. It's like the glands are so glistening. And um, I had a nursery, I mean, a, a grape grower from Napa call me when I was at work. And he said, do you have this tree? I go, yeah, we've been growing that. It's Kila. Q U I L L A J A, which must be Spanish. Kilaha saponaria. 100%. Yay! And um, that's the one that I think would, it's not a native, but it's yeah. tough. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever seen that one at a nursery. I just wrote yeah. it in. But There's, I know a lot of nurseries will special order things for you. You know what else is? Um, is it sapium? No, what's the one that has the seed with the little leaf-like tongue, Tilia. Tilia is a mostly uh, cool summer rain area native that um, the Asian people, and I've seen them collecting the the bract below the- Is it a linden? Because they make tea. No. What's the so, botanical name? Uh, Tilia, there's a, there's a number of different ones. The common name is, um, there's a couple of them. Micoliana, yeah. Cordata, Tomentosa. Yeah. So, and, and, and I've heard that there are a lot of bees on them in when they've used them as street trees up north. I read that somewhere. Okay. Um, there was a, a, it says here in helpabee.org, Dr. Gordon Frankie is also with this lab. That is his lab. Oh, that is his That's lab. That's what he Actually. started. That's his project. All right, so I see people uh, definitely know that uh, bees have flower preferences, so great. Okay, I better hurry up for you guys are all starved to death and asleep. Okay, <laughs> so let's just look really quick at combining plants. This is the same bed. So this is on the left is early season, Eridgeron, the uh, seaside daisy, Nepeta, all the things I've already mentioned, toy on grasses, uh, deer grass, uh, a la lavender here. So I just like plugged in all the stuff that we've been looking at and kind of arranged it. And then in between on the right, I planted mid to late season stuff, the pink buckwheat, the epilobium. And what happens is when the nepeta was done, because this is a plant in the plant sale area, so it's for demo the volunteers would go in and cut those back. So the nepetas would kind of go back and then these other things would come up and kind of fill in around them, but it didn't matter. They didn't cover them, but they would um, coexist really nicely with them. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you sure shoved a lot of plants in there, Ellen. <laughs> yeah, Ellen, uh, Emily always used to say I was a shoehorn gardener. <laughs> but I felt like this was all about demonstration and beauty and um, it wasn't that hard to maintain, you know, but that's easy for me to say I have a volunteer team, but, you know, I yeah. mean, I could have maintained it myself. It wasn't that big. I mean, that's a probably a, let me think about how long that is, probably about 40 feet by eight feet wide. So it wasn't, wasn't too bad, too terrible. Plus there was no weeds. When you yeah. plant like that, you don't get any weeds coming up so you don't have the weed. I'd rather chop than weed any day. But again, right now, especially with those 100 degree temperatures, a plant cannot photosynthesize like over 85 or something like that, somewhere in that range. So when it's 100, everybody starts sending images to me of, why is my plant dying? I'm like, 
the poor thing, it's 100 degrees out there, get a break. It's, it's not dying, it's just adjusting by losing some of its leaves because it can't support transpiration for as much foliage as it has. So it's got to drop some of them to balance it out. And again, what, what you see now, if you go out there now, you see beautiful epilobium canum in bloom. Every garden, I think, should have a California fuchsia. Gallardia, also in bloom, although a little harder to keep looking nice. Beware of recommended plants that can spread. You always want to look up, does it spread? And these are two that if you water them, they will spread. If you don't water them, they may not do anything. So there's a, a nice point in the middle where you want to deep irrigate them, but infrequently. And for your, your own garden, you can uh, find out more. Some are short-lived. I cannot keep the um, Agastache, forget the common name of that one. Uh, I can't grow those at all. Some of these yellow Gallardias, they died the same month they were planted. Like, they established, started to bloom, and then they just petered out when it got hot. Uh, Sphorelsia, I mentioned, it's been hard for me to establish. I think it's my soil is so heavy. So I put it in more sun in a drier area. And then this Bidens, which is super highly recommended uh, by the Frankie group, um, we've never been able to keep it alive yet. We're still trying. We're there in Berkeley, so it's cooler probably. Some need deadheading. If you want it to still bloom, you can have WR in bloom. This uh, seaside daisy almost all the time, and there's one of those cool little jewel uh, bees. Um, but you have to type, cut the old ones off, and you have to give it, you can't forget to water it and let it go completely dry, because then it'll just go dormant and sit there and not do anything. Coreopsis is a super well-rated plant, but uh, the perennial forms need to be deadheaded if they're not Deadheaded when they start to set seed, they go out of bloom, and ditto on the Gallardia need to be deadheaded. The ones that I still want to add is this the Russian sage, because I saw really cool stuff. Uh, the Nepetas, you cut them back after the first bloom. They have grown back right now. They look really nice. They're nice green little mounds, and they've got little, not as good flowering, but they've got some flowers on them. And this is just a crazy one I threw in um, that is Un, relatively unknown, but it's a white scabiosa, Okraluca, and I, I'm not 100% sure of its perenniality or whether it just keeps receding, but I'm going to try to find that out, and that has a whole bunch of different uh, kinds of flying things on it right now. So if I had to pick all the absolute best, I looked back to what's native in my area. This is a research project that was done at the Cape Bay Valley, which is in very Far from here, and look at this, Toyon had 39 species of bees on it that they found. Buckwheats, 31. Baccarus silicifolia, not very ornamental, only for a wildlife area. Same with the Menzelia, this you can't grow. But redbuds, 21 species. And so those are the ones that I push right up to the top of my list. I still need to get a load of Scaparius, they changed the name. Acmispon, Glaber, something like that, something horrid. Uh, if you wanted to seed a couple of lupin in there, you could try these succulentus. Uh, but the, the cultivated forms, the named cultivars of Baccarus, 12 species, and they're good for butterflies. And that is the size that could fit in a normal garden. It would need annual, probably cutting to the ground to control the size. But it, it wouldn't be too bad if you just if you could do it every year. So some of these, and then a Ceanothus, you know, some of these others are a lot harder to get your hands on. But what about rosemary? Don't you already have one? You know, I know I do. And so that's actually was rated very high as a nectar source. California lilacs, many ornamental gardens already have that. And then also the sages. And this one, in this study, they use the mellifera, but I suspect if you really um, did just salvias, you might find there are more that would be appealing. I mentioned manzanitas for early. I wanted to show you what things are going to look like. Ray Hartman. This is that valley violet, which in the water trials at Davis that um, Lauren Oki's doing, he may have showed you a picture. Um, it didn't matter whether they got high, medium water or low water, they still looked fabulous. So that's, that was an unexpected result. 
toy on with some bees in, I believe it's the first week of June. And then the fruit in the winter and the cedar wax wings go wild for it. Um, and then barberry, which we forget, but it, I forget. It blooms early in spring and apparently it's a good bee plant. Okay, buck, I'm gonna go faster because I'm so over. Buckwheats. Uh, Goodwin Creek Gray is this one here, blooms in my yard. It only has stopped blooming in the 100 degrees. Um, and then I assume we'll start again in the spring. Mentioned that already. Uh, mentioned both of these, so the doggo. More asters. Oh, actually, this is my front yard. This is the, this is Aster Purple Dome. See how it's not as dense because I have a little shade. And then this is little Carlo with a sedum uh, autumn joy. And I just love that little area. That's how Autumn Joy changes. It starts out creamy and then turns pink. And then if you leave it, it can turn this beautiful um, rust color that it's almost impossible to keep them on chairs from cutting them off because they just want to. But, but if you leave them, sometimes they'll have this beautiful fall color. Um, and then once they flop, you can come. Okay, I think this is the last poll question. Okay, I've got our last poll here. So manzanitas, California lilacs, and red buds, red buds are great to plant for supporting early pollinators. I really like uh, what you've been doing with this presentation, Ellen, in that you're talking about the mid, early, the late, and then also um, the different pollinators that you can see. And um, as somebody who's been interested in pollinators for a while and is learning about the plants, and some of the different bees. Now it's like tying those together to see what you know what you can put in the landscape so that you can have that year-round um, beneficial insect pollinators visiting. So this has been really great. Okay. I'm, gonna I'm gonna zip through these last couple and yeah. not talk about them too much just so we can get to the library slides, okay? Perfect. This was just more examples and pictures. And oh, I just want to mention uh, butterflies. I think that Anne's talking to me into doing a butterfly. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm hoping December or January. So I think and that'll you're be... going to get butterflies with the plants I've already talked about. So right. you can start there. The next thing is larval food plants and just what's in your, uh, what's native around. Learning to recognize which butterflies. But this is my favorite. Life. This eats street trees. It eats the, uh, the larva eats um, uh, London plane tree and things like that. Okay, now I'm at the end. True. So we did have a question or two. Um, somebody wanted to know if there were any recommended plants for containers for pollinators. Well, I do know same. I've had the salvia hot lips in a container and it's done well and... Yeah, those tough pages. salvias, that'd be where I would start. The long blooming, uh, something like hot lips. And then... Um, when they get big, so you probably want a pretty good size container. Yeah, and then the Levangela Goodwin Creek, because that thing blooms forever. It gets big. Both of those get the big. The lavender. So uh -huh. it might be, Goodwin Creek. Yeah, after three years, it'll outgrow the pot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you can move it out and get a new one. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody else asked a question about a specific plant and if it could be grown, but um, maybe I could have them email you and we'll go ahead and um, because it sounded like maybe they've been able to grow it, so maybe they could um, contact you. And I, there, I recognize the name. I'm not sure if it's Tess, but um, I think she's a master gardener in one of our local counties. Um, and Dune says she has California fuchsia in pots, so it seems like you could try it. Yeah, and, and Tilias are deciduous trees. Oh, Tilias are deciduous. Okay, because yeah. I was hoping we would find more. Um, evergreen recommendations, but I think uh, Toyon is going to be a good bet, and uh, I don't know what else. So, so I wanted to mention one more thing, and then I'll show you, let me show you the resource slide. So, and then the next one I believe is the libraries. Okay, so um, when I went to the blog for that 10 bees and, and 10, I mean to the website for the 10 bees and 10 plants handout that Katie and I did, um, I noticed that they had established a bee blog for people that were interested and for planting for pollinators. 
and there's a blog there. And I thought that exists. If people have questions and a group wanted to get together, I would be happy to post and monitor to that site. And then we could have questions and discussions. So maybe I can, Anne, I can look into that and, uh, and then let you know. How's that? Yeah, let me know. That sounds neat. And then if people, if you're, if, if you're someone who might be interested in that. Uh, well, here's a good know. question. Are lantanas considered a pollinator? Yes. Uh, no, mine is covered butterfly. with little skippers. Yeah, butterfly nectar plant. Yeah. And um, not for bees, though, because the tubular, I guess most of the bees' mouth parts are too short. To Speaking be of tubular, we should have you do hummingbirds, too, or would that be another one? <laughs> that's, a, that's another one. <laughs> okay, well, let's just do butterflies next, and then we'll bother you about uh, hummingbirds. So that'll be awesome. You know, we just don't want you to get too bored in your retirement. So <laughs> In my COVID isolation here. Yes. So if we don't have any other questions, um, we could go ahead and have Diane uh, show her photo here. And she's going to talk to us about uh, the Stanislaus County Library. And even if you're not from Stanislaus County, I'm sure a lot of these books are available at your local library. So Diane, take it away. Thank you, Anne. And thank you so much for letting me have a few minutes to talk about the library any library because that's what we're here for to help you find the resources that you need no matter where you are. So yes, I'm a librarian with Stanislaw County Library. I'm centered in Turlock. Um, I have been in the area for 25 years and what I was so happy to come to the Central Valley because I can grow things like I couldn't grow into the in the Bay Area. So that was super for me. And uh, as part of my job several years ago, I bought all the gardening books for the county so that's my background. I'm not an expert, but I have an interest. So the slide that you see in front of you is uh, highlights our Hoopla app. And many of you uh, around the state uh, will probably have, uh, your library will probably have access to Hoopla uh, app as well. So this is a free app that's available through your Apple App Store or your Google Play Store. You just download it to your device enter in information such as your library card number and you can borrow books audiobooks, movies, television, and music on demand. You don't have to worry about returns. They just disappear from your device automatically. A similar app set that we have are um, Cloud Library, and others of you might uh, be familiar with Overdrive, and those do the same thing. So you can do the next slide, please. OK. so. Uh, from Hoopla, uh, I wanted to highlight a, a couple books. Um, so in, in the essence of time, let me just kind of uh, say one of these, uh, the uh, Attracting Native Pollinators is available in physical format from our library system and in ebook format. The other, the Pollinator Friendly Gardening, is something that's just available from us through Hoopla. So um, yes. So uh, these are pretty similar. Uh, they are broad. They cover all of North America. They uh, uh, address gar the home gardeners, community gardeners. Uh, if you're in a, a planning for a, a city or you're planning uh, for a, a golf course or if you are a farmer, they have something for everyone. So they're both broad in that sense. Um, they are both talk about pollinators uh, and they both emphasize bees, but they talk about moths and butterflies, beetles, and um, other insects and things. Um, the difference is, of course, I was happy to, to have um, Ellen men mention Xerxes because the attracting native pollinators is from Xerxes, so they are very, very concerned about, um, about uh, the, the pollinators and making uh, uh, very friendly gardens. Um, oh, I, what I should say too about these books is that um, they both offer uh, landscape um, suggestions and I really like the Attracting Native Pollinators for their suggestions on lands landscape design. Uh, the difference also with Pollinator Friendly Gardening is the author of that is a master gardener and she is originally from California, so she has that background. Um, it is also different because it uh, offers uh, uh, 
little uh, facts or not so fun facts, and it has an ask the expert uh, section. So those are just a couple of samples of, of items that you can find at our library system. And then just briefly, the RB Digital is another free app that you can get through app app store or your Google Play Store. Again, you just download it, enter in your library account information, and you have access to over 3,500 magazines. And there's a, a nice section of uh, gardening magazines available. And then finally, on the next slide, we just wanted to highlight our website. So you don't have to remember anything that I've said. You can go to our website, stanislawlibrary.com, and you can find all the information I've just said uh, in, in multiple areas on the website. But uh, the three I wanted to highlight is you, if you see that light gray bar, it says about us, catalog and e-resources. So about us will tell you where your nearest branch is and what their hours are. The catalog will help you find the books that you're looking for. And the e-resources is where you're going to find information on how to download those apps. So if you have any questions at all, check out About Us, find your branch, give us a call, and we're there to help you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. That was really informative and it's great to see all of these books uh, that folks can get from their local libraries, um, whether they're open or not, you can get them digitally. So Ellen, I don't think we have uh, any other questions, but uh, I just wanna thank you so much. Ellen is one of my favorite people and um, I really appreciate that she's willing to do this kind of presentation and share her knowledge and um, I think we've all learned a lot more and I know I could watch this presentation over five more times and still learn a lot because there's so many little details and I don't know about you guys, but I want to learn more about all these little bees, you know, so I can recognize, you know, the different ones that come into my landscape. And like Ellen said in the spring to pay more attention instead of being out shopping. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, like I said, hopefully we'll uh, have you do one on butterflies and moths. We'll be in touch. And then uh, something on hummingbirds. So, okay. More to look forward to. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. And this video will be posted to YouTube in about 10 days if you want to watch it again. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks for all the kind comments.